Janet Merck. Uh, Janet is a professor of psychology at the uh, University of Madison in Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin, <laughs> Madison. <laughs> I hope I do better than that. a laboratory for cancer research there. And her interest in uh, mass circle type activities uh, really stemmed from her son, who was, I believe, a two-time IMO winner, something like this. And uh, she has a long history at Joe Gallion, which I just heard about. I think this is another uh, dinner conversation over beer or something like this. Uh, anyway, thank you for, for coming here, Jen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, as, as you know, I'm not a mathematician, but uh, have, them, have it in my family. Um, I want to thank my collaborators um, a lot for the invaluable help they've given me on numerous parts of the study. Uh, Tito Andrescu, uh, who is a former U.S. Uh, math Olympic coach, uh, Joe Gallion. Um, who's uh, the Putnam historian in, in the context here. Uh, Janet Hyde, who's a professor of psychology and women's studies. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, no, it's... John, someone... Oh, I'm sorry. This is... It, it's going to... Um, and uh, Jonathan Kane, who's co-parented Daniel with me. Um, <laughs> things don't want this talk to go well. <laughs> okay, so, so as I said, uh, um, I got, <laughs> we're working backwards here. Um, my involvement in this work on, on uh, gender, culture, and math got uh, started uh, four years ago um, when Nancy Hopkins uh, phoned me, Nancy Hopkins is a good friend who's a fellow cancer researcher, and uh, some of you may know Nancy Hopkins is the one who, who uh, walked out on Larry Summers and went to the press with Larry Summers' infamous comments at this conference about uh, gender and STEM field researchers. Um, so here we go. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, we have the fact that fewer than 5% of tenured research uh, faculty in the top six ranked U.S. graduate math departments were female in 2007. The number's a little better in 2009. I haven't carefully reanalyzed it yet. Uh, examples are, for example, Nancy Hopkins in 1994 was the chair of this committee at MIT that published a study on the status of women, tenured women faculty at MIT in the School of Science. And one of the things they found in their study is they couldn't analyze what was happening to women in the math department because there weren't any. Um, and, you know, MIT actually did their first hire of their female instructor. That first female instructor at MIT was hired in 1967, which is actually the year I matriculated to MIT as an undergrad. And I remember being there, 5% we female undergrads. And I think there were two women faculty at about 900 in, in MIT at that time. Um, Harvard has never had a tenured woman math professor. And so the obvious question is why? Uh, it's the typical nature versus nurture or biology versus culture argument. And the uh, biological argument, which seems to be fairly prevalent in the U.S., not just by Larry Summers, but lots of people tend to think this, is, is that boys and girls are somehow born differently, different hormones or whatever is making brain differences, and therefore they end up being different. <laughs> and here's examples in the popular press. Um, here's some more examples. You know, let's find out how women's and men's brains are different. And it just must just be that the female brain is formed differently, and therefore you're just not going to get a lot of outstanding math, math professors who are women. Um, one, one striking thing is that this is from the uh, uh, European Women in Mathematics had published uh, this chart, 1996, which is just a phenomenal chart. To, it's part of the response to Larry Summers. This is the percentage of women among tenured mathematicians at the university level in countries in Western Europe, in Europe, uh, mo most of Europe. And it's, it's really striking what you see, for example, um, most of the data is from, from 1995 or so. Uh, this is, happens to be West Germany from 1986. West Germany had 2% women 
uh, tenured uh, math professors. So you can see it ranges from lows of 2%, you know, under 4%, all the way to places like Italy, Turkey, and Portugal that have 40 to 50, 30 to 50%. So there's this huge disparity even within Europe as to um, percent of uh, tenured uh, faculty in the math departments who are women. Uh, this isn't the very, very top departments. This is, you know, universities as a whole in, in, in these countries. So, you, you, you know, in the U.S., the number is a lot better than 5% overall. If you go to a lot of four-year teaching colleges, you know, it can be a lot more than the 5% we're talking about. Okay, so the question is, do, do uh, females exist to possess profound tr intrinsic aptitude for mathematics? Um, I, I know you're all laughing because the answer... jeez. Oh, <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> That, that thing from five minutes ago. That installation just installed and is now rebooting. Talk. Okay. Um, the next slide I was about to show was one from the uh, MAA uh, came out with a poster this last year that, that shows, you know, very famous women mathematicians through the millennia. Is it shutting down completely now? It's <laughs> um, And you know, that there have been, you know, famous women mathematicians since ancient Greece, right on, you know, through the Middle Ages into the 19th and 20th century. Um, it would be, you know, so obviously, we all know there are women who can excel at this very highest level. <laughs> yes. competitive math events, what are the percentages of girls to boys at competitive math competitions? So for instance, yesterday in the math battle, there was one girl among 12. Yes. Yeah, I was going to point that out. And see, we, 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 that's fine to do. We can go, go to that later in my talk. I had some slides where, for example, yeah, yesterday, it was, we all saw one, it was one girl out of 12. And what was also striking is there were only three white boys that we, we had, th those 12 kids were, were nine Asian Americans and... Well, she wasn't and, Asian, she was from India, right? There was, there was, well, she, there was one white. Oh. India's an eight, yeah, I'm counting Indi India, 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 yeah, yeah. So, so ye yesterday's event, the, there were nine Asian students and, and three whites. And w one of the things, I ever get to show my slides, uh, is that, for example, if you look at the Math Olympic uh, summer training program, which th these are the kids who qualify for the, this training camp based on uh, doing well on the USA Math Olympiad, which you can think is sort of similar to what these kids were doing, the numbers are really striking. So even at, at, at I call it MOP, um, what you'll find is if you look at girls, talking, if, you, if you look at that, my girl table, uh, what you find is that uh, Asian girls are not underrepresented in proportion to their percent of the population in the U.S., which is 4.5%. So like when you saw not 9 out of 12 were Asian yesterday, that's out of a population. They're only 4.5% of the U.S. population. So what, what's happening is Asian girls aren't underrepresented in the Math Olympic camp. It's white and historically underrepresented minorities that are enormously underrepresented. So, so White girls at MOP are 30-fold underrepresented in proportion to their percentage of the population. But Asian and uh, Eastern European immigrant girls, it's US-born whites are 30-fold underrepresented. White girls who are immigrants from Eastern Europe are also in proportion to their percent of the population. OK, so, so it's US-born whites who are, for whatever reasons, choosing not to excel in math. Um, and What's also striking, you see the same thing even with the boys. So if you look at the boy data, uh, Asian Americans and, and ethnic Jewish boys are 10 to 20 fold overrepresented in proportion to their percent of the US population, whereas the white boys 
uh, are barely even with their percent. And if, and if you normalize it, the fact that most of the kids at, at MOP are boys, they're actually around twofold underrepresented. Okay, so there's this huge um, ethnic cultural thing that's affecting whether kids are bothering to excel at this level. And, and I did the MOP data because hey, everyone has seen this. You know, their own little personal examples is, you know, why are all the kids at the math camp Asian? Or why, are, you know, why aren't there any girls here? And what you see, it, it, it's really, it's a cultural thing that some kids are deciding to do other things. And, and we'll hear a talk this afternoon. I assume we'll get much more deeply into the culture. Um, but, you know, for example, I even see it with my, you know, local high school uh, math, math team. And you go to, you know, even white boys don't want to be there. Because they say that, you know, that, 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 that's an Asian thing. The, the, the Asians love to be there because for them it's a social outlet. They're there with other bright Asians. And even white boys are saying, I don't want to be there because, you know, I'm, I'm then, you know, being either labeled a nerd or, or I'm not hanging out with my group. Yes? All right, the, the question is, do you get better representation if you look at all the programs, rather the science-type programs, I assume, rather than just math? I haven't done a detailed analysis of it. I, I think it might be a little better. I think math is the most extreme, but I, I haven't analyzed those data carefully. Yes? Oh, yeah, the, 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 the data for underrepresented minorities is, is um, MOP has never, as far as I know, had a woman underrepresented minority there. And they've had a total of two underrepresented minority males in the uh, decade I was looking at. So, so, yeah, the underrepresented minorities are even more underrepresented. Yes, Mary? One girl. All right. What Mary just said is, is there's been one girl at the, uh, the, 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 this is the equivalent of MOP for the, for the computer informatics Olympiad. Yes? Um, the question is, is the data for non-competitive events? I haven't analyzed that. It would probably be a lot harder to, to get the data. Yeah, um, and, and, and actually my, <laughs> my, my, my husband will briefly be talking this afternoon in a panel about an event he has that's a, that's a team math competition. And the hope is that if you have the kids working in teams, girls might feel more comfortable doing it than having the, the, the exams to get into MOP are all individual things where everyone's competing individually. Yes? Um, no, I have not done, the question was women's colleges versus co-ed colleges. I have not done that analysis. One would assume there's a higher percent women faculty at the women's colleges, but, yeah. Yes? You mentioned um, Jewish boys. Any data for Jewish girls? Um, well, Allison Miller is, is, is half Jewish. Uh, she, she was the one girl who, uh, one, one half Jewish girl who was at Mott. The, 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 data, the, the numbers are too small to have any statistical significance when you, because the, the girl numbers, you're only talking about two dozen girls. And so you, you can see that, they're, that the Asians are very overrepresented relative to the U.S. born white girls, but you know, the Jews are only 2% of the U.S. population. So if, you, if you're taking something that's 2% over something that's, <laughs> that's a small number, it's not statistically, jeez, it's still not. I did prepare a nice talk. Um, this is a lot of order now. Any other? Now <laughs> oh, we've put up a new computer.
Thank you. <laughs> Is it going to be okay? All right. Uh, that's the answer to the question. We, 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 we all know that. Here, here's the, the poster from the MAA. I'll race through a few of these. And you know, it, goes, it goes all the way back to ancient Greece. There have been lots of women, in, including here, here's a group of, of four uh, women who were immigrants from Taiwan, from National uh, Taiwan University, and including you know, one who's on the math department, a tenured math professor at Princeton. Um, OK. So I'll try to race through some of this. So the, the main data analysis was looking at um, the, the Putnam IMO and USA uh, Math Olympiad, which is the qualifying exam, one of the qualifying exams to get on the IMO team in the US and Canada. Um, you, you folks all know about this. I don't have to explain it. Um, these are extremely difficult uh, pro problem solving exams, not multiple choice type answers, but like the, what you saw yesterday afternoon in that competition. The students have to write out detailed proofs. Um, so to give you an example, if you look at the Putnam competition, this is the, the college level competition. It's only taken by students in the U who are attending colleges in the US and Canada. Okay. Um, in the last 17 years, there have been 11 women who have been among the top 25 in the Putnam, okay? um, including women uh, who have been Putnam Fellows. This is the top five. So, this is, you know, so clearly, we have women who excel at this extremely high level in mathematical problem solving. However, if you look, uh oh, I don't like that hand there. <laughs> if, if, if you look at the birth countries of these women, one of the things that's striking is only three of these women were born in the US. Uh, most of them were born in Eastern Europe. Um, so, for example, of the three Putnam uh, fellows, two were born in Romania. Romania is a country 1 15th the size of the US. Here, here's, a, 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 here's a third woman from Romania. How can there be as many Romanian women who immigrate, you know, who came to the US for college as there are US women excelling on the Putnam? There's clearly a cultural difference going on here between Eastern Europe and the US. Um, he, here's um, women who scored among the very top in the world in the IMO. Um, I, I, I took the women whose scores were in the top 16 in the world, which is our, our son came in tied for 16th in the world. Okay, so I use that as the. <laughs> Were there women who, ex who did even better than, than our son, the IMO? And you can see that there were such women, including, including Eugenia, who, who was on the uh, committee yesterday afternoon with, with, the, with the student competition, who you know, obtained a perfect score in the IMO twice. Um, so these women do exist who can excel in mathematical problem solving. For example, Mir Mir Miriam uh, recently got a tenured faculty position at Stanford. So they, they not only excel in problem solving, they can also go on and, and become uh, top research professors. Uh, but again, if you look at this, this list of 18 women, only one, Sherry, uh, is from the US. Um, again, most of them are from Eastern Europe or Eastern Asia. However, if you take these numbers and you say, OK, there are women who excel at this phenomenal level in mathematical problem solving, um, there were 18 of them over um, yeah, uh, the last two decades. I, I took the two, last two decade period. So there were 18 over two decades. That comes out to about 3% or so of the students at the very, very top in the IMO who were women. The numbers were similar for the Putnam. It's only a few percent of, of those really top students who are being women. And as I said, of those, almost none of them are from the US. So why are there so few females identified as possessing profound talent in math? And the two possible answers are talent is rare among females. In other words, somehow their brains are wired differently or whatever. They, just very few women have this ability to excel like this. Or they exist but are not being identified and nurtured to excel. And here's Larry Summers. Our <laughs> And here, here's, here's some quotes from, from Summer's uh, infamous talk. 
There are issues of intrinsic aptitude and particularly of the variability of aptitude and that those considerations are reinforced by what are in fact lesser factors involving socialization and continuing discrimination. Okay, these are the exact words he was saying at this conference. Going on, it's, it's talking about people who were three and a half, four standard deviations above the mean um, in the one to uh, 5,000 to one in 10,000 class even small differences in the standard deviation will translate into very large differences in the available pool, uh, substantially out. Um, and again, in other words, he was hypothesizing, he claimed he was hypothesizing, different availability of math aptitude at the high end. So he, what he's basically trying to say is in the, you know, in the normal distribution, there are plenty of, of women who can do math, but when you get way out at the extremes, you're not gonna find many women there. Okay, so, so th this hypothesis was originally, you know, came up in 1894. It's not original to, to Larry Summers. It's called the greater male variability hypothesis. And the, the way people standardly try to test this hypothesis is, is they use what they call a variance ratio, which they look at the distribution of scores on various standardized tests, and they look at the variability, the variance for males divided by the variance for females. If the variance ratio is greater than one, that means there's greater male variability. Okay, so variance ratios between 0.9 and 1.1 are considered negligible. Um, 1.2 is small, but it's beginning to be significant if you look out four sigma on the curve. So here we're taking uh, distributions with a variance ratio of 1.2, which is about what they measure in the US. Standardized tests frequently come up in the U.S. of variance ratio about 1.2. If you look at this, all right, so the, this, this green thing, this is the girls, the boys. Uh, you can see most of the distribution, it's trivial differences. But if you get four sigma out, now you can see there's quite a big difference here. So this, this little part here, the brown here is the girls and the reddish one is, is the boy curve. So if, if you ask how many children, how, how many people will be above four sigma, uh, the probability of a male versus female is about one in 15,000 versus one in 73,000. So you get a ratio, it would only be 18% girls out there by, by this distribution. If you go above five sigma, you say, well, maybe a Harvard professor is a one in a million. Then at five sigma, males is about 1.2 million, females is about 13 million, you'd still have 8.5% females, even out at five sigma, okay? So even assuming you believe in the greater male variance hypothesis, it still doesn't explain how you could have so few women faculty. Okay, so what is the reason for the math variance ratio being greater than one? If, if it's due to biological factors, the variance ratio should be consistent across countries and cultures. If it's truly an innate biological thing, the 1.2 measured in the US should be the same thing you measure in other countries as well. However, if it's cultural, the variance ratio could vary significantly. Okay, um, this is Janet Hyde's my collaborator. On the, we, we have a paper that's in press in Proceedings in National Academy. So some of this data is in this paper. Uh, so both the variance ratio and what's called the effect size, which Janet Hyde measures, uh, the effect size is the difference in the means of the distributions of males versus females normalized to the standard deviation of the pool. Um, you would expect it to vary widely both across nations and among cultures within, na within nations. So Asian American versus white across nations. I'm going to show you data Iceland versus the U.S. So what is the reason for variance ratio being and, and, and uh, effect size being greater than one, and I'm gonna say it's mostly culture, if not exclusively culture, you know. Um, and this is taking data from what I'm gonna call the PISA, the Program International Student Assessment. It's given once every three years, worldwide testing, about 40 countries around the world, of 15-year-old school children, okay? In the, the 2003 PISA has been uh, analyzed extensively by lots of people. So the 2003 was taken by over 275 students in 40 nations, and it focused on math literacy. So this is a really good data set for math. 
testing problem solving in real life situations that use math. And uh, you don't have to see the details here. So, so this is a study that was published last spring by this Italian group where they're looking at the ratio of girls to boys scoring above the 95th percentile or above the 99th percentile. So we're, they're trying to get out towards the extreme. Uh, what is that ratio? And what's been done here, the, the gray is, is the 99th percentile, and it's just been ordered um, by, by the 99th percentile what that ratio is from smallest to largest. Um, can you guys, hopefully you can't read it, guess where the U.S. is on this? Here's where the U.S. is. The U.S. ranks 36 out of those 40 countries in the ratio of girls to boys scoring above the 90 percent, uh, 99 percentile. Okay? Whereas it turns out there are actually countries up here. This is Thailand, Iceland, United Kingdom, and Indonesia, where the boy to girl ratio is approximately one. In Iceland, it's actually more girls than boys. So here's, <laughs> you know, uh, more girls than boys score above the 99 percentile on the P's in, in Iceland. Okay, so there's something going on here that some countries, they don't have a, a difference between the number of girls and boys scoring at the 99 percentile. Um, this is thing called the gender gap index, which uh, Larry Summers economists uh, measure. Uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, it's an annual measure they've been publishing the data on where the, the, in the, the latest 2007 report, uh, 128 countries were involved with the data. And it's a, um, a complex formula. It's a mixture of measuring economic participation and opportunities of women relative to men in the country. In other words, can they get jobs that, that they can use? Uh, educational attainment. In other words, how much schooling do women relative to men have in the country? Political empowerment is uh, you know, what percent of the nation's national politicians are women. And health and survival is things like maternal death rate. OK? Um, all right, so for the 2007 Gender Gap Index that came out a few months ago, top five countries are Sweden, Norway, Finland, Iceland, New Zealand. OK, so mo most of those are northern Scandinavian countries. Bottom five, as you might expect, are uh, mostly Muslim nations where women are heavily suppressed by the religion. Where do people guess the U.S. is? Anyone want to guess? <laughs> huh? Ten. Ten? Six, six. <laughs> We're not quite that bad. Okay, the U.S. is 31st between Namibia, Estonia, and Kazakhstan. Okay? So people who think we have gender equality here, we're far from it compared to some of these other countries. So taking the gender gap index, we did a correlation analysis between the gender gap index and the ratio of girls to boys scoring above the 95th percentile on the PISA. And this is what the plot looks like. And, and you can see, you know, there's a reasonably good correlation here. You know, the, cor the correlation coefficient is 0.34. Okay. Um, here's looking at the mean scores on the PISA. Again, th th this, is, this is published by, by this group last spring. Again, there's a fairly good correlation between the data. Um, I've uh, done the analysis with my husband's help on the IMO, and the correlation's really good. Correlation coefficient of 0.44. Um, between percent girls on the top 30 ranked IMO teams and the, the gender gap index. In other words, in countries where girls have, have greater equality, um, you, they're more prevalent. And, you know, you, you could still say, oh, well, maybe so there's a genetic component there. In different countries, uh, girls might be genetically different and more prone to be able to do math. Uh, here's some examples. Uh, if you compare West Germany and East Germany before reunification, the years immediately before re reunification, uh, West Germany never had a girl on their IMO team. Um, while East Germany had five girls on their IMO team in that decade. What's the total size of the team? Six, six students per year. So this, this was over a 13-year period. Germany only started. Uh, uh, East Germany had uh, about 20 girls on their team from the beginning. Uh, West Germany didn't start participating until 1977. But when they did, they weren't, having, they weren't identifying girls. Uh, same thing, this, this is looking at uh, the Czech Republic versus Slovakia. 
immediately after, starting in the years immediately after partitioning of the country. Um, since the last so 16 years, Slovakia has had three times as many girls as the Czech Republic. Uh, here I'm comparing Japan and South Korea. Uh, again, Japan, this was one girl who was at the IMO twice uh, versus South Korea having nine. Uh, and most people would think these populations are not significantly genetically different. So there's obviously cultural factors going on here that are determining whether they're being identified. Okay, so the conclusion is gender equity and other cultural factors are prime determinants of how well females perform in math with respect to the mean, the talented, which is this 99 percentile, and the extreme high-end IMO caliber. Um, okay, this is a paper that came out in Science Magazine last November, just when Larry Summers was being appointed to his current position. The, the timing was impeccable. These are economists who published this. And they were, this is the data they have, uh, again, on the 2003 PISA, showing that there's, uh, most countries show greater male variance, okay? And the conclusion they had from this was that greater male variance is a robust phenomenon, okay? That, that was their claim from, from those data. They say, see all these countries, and almost all of them show greater male variance. And our paper that's going to come out shortly says the variance ratio varies a lot. And it is about one for some nations. So if, if this is innate biological differences of the genders, how can you have it varying a lot? And how can there be some countries where the variance ratio is approximately one? OK, and, and so look, looking at the data, this is taking. <laughs> Looking at the data, uh, you can see here's countries like, you know, like Denmark and the Netherlands, where the variance ratio you know, is 1, essentially. Um, yet you know, the US and Canada, it's about 1.2. Uh, this is another uh, international math testing from uh, an, another publication that came out recently, where they analyze the data differently. So look, looking at the differences in standard deviations, normalized to within standard deviation. And so he, here you're looking for 0. Again, you know, Denmark, there's no difference in the, in the variance ratio. For some countries, it's actually negative. The variance for girls is, is measuring greater than boys. Um, so for, for there to be such differences, it really can't be that this is a, bi, you know, a, a gender-specific difference. Uh, again, even looking at the, Janet Hyde had published a paper almost two decades ago, an extensive meta-analysis uh, of all the available standardized tests at the time. And again, you can see, even within the US, for African Americans and Hispanics, um, there really is no difference in, in, in the means. However, few, a, Asian Americans, actually girls, are doing slightly better than boys um, on these standardized tests. However, if you look at you know, US whites, uh, or Australians, which in 1990 would have been mostly whites, Canadians back then would have been mostly whites also, there you see significant differences. So in these white populations, girls aren't performing as well as boys, but in some of these other cultures, they are. Um, I've already talked about this while we were waiting for the computer, so I'm, I'm not going to show that. Here, here's for the, uh, um, the last couple of years, there's been the uh, US has participated in what's called the China Girls Mathematical Olympiad, where these are US girls picked based on scoring among the top on the, on the USA Math Olympiad exam. So in 2007, the top eight girls scorers on that exam were seven Chinese Americans and one white. Remember, uh, Asians are only 4.5% of the US population. 2008 looks similar. Here there were five Chinese Americans, two Korean Americans, and one white who was the same white as here. <laughs> so there's clearly cultural things. This is the, the boy data, the, which I, I already talked. The, the Asian and Jewish boys are 10 to 20-fold overrepresented in proportion to their percent of the populations. The US born, you know, the white boys are barely even with their populations. Here's the underrepresented minorities. Um, he, here's an example of this is the 2006 results of the, the USA Math Olympiad. Uh, just, these are the top 12 scorers who are honored and then compete to, 
to who are the six on the team. Here, here's an example you can see in 2006. You know, there was only one girl out of the 12. There was also only one white boy. Okay, so, so these, these data look similar to what you saw in that competition yesterday. Uh, so we have non-Jewish white boys as well as historically underrepresented minorities and non-Asian girls are underrepresented among students identified as excelling in math at the highest levels. Um, what could the reasons for this be? Hopefully you'll hear more about this tomorrow, uh, this afternoon. Um, one is uh, uh, d difference in cultural attitudes, for example, in terms of performance. What's prominent in this culture in, among the, the white majority is this feeling that it's innate ability, as Larry Summers was hypothesizing, that you either have the math gene or you don't have the math gene. And if you don't have it, it's perfectly OK not to do well at math. You know, some kids can just do it and others can't. Whereas the predominant Asian American culture seems to be uh, you know, that, it, that math is a vital skill, just like reading. You need to learn to do it. And if you're not doing well, you just need to work harder, that working hard will produce results. So there's this huge disparity there that's based on a different cultural belief. Uh, then the problem socially, whereas you know, a Asians are prominent in math clubs and schools, feel it's a great place to meet and socialize with other smart, hard hardworking Asian kids, whereas the whites are saying, only Asians and nerds do math. It's uncool to do it. They might get socially ostracized if they hang out at the math club. Um, I'm just going to skip over some of these things. All right, getting uh, to the point here. So what happens when you get to the faculty level? Um, here's a, the data of taking these, the top six ranked math departments. The, the sixth one didn't have any women. So um, if you look at the, uh, the tenured, there were eight of them when I did this in 2007. Uh, among the, the non-tenured, tenure track faculty, roughly tenure track, if you want to call them, there were 12 more, increasing the sample size a little bit. If you look at the birth countries, what you can see is very few of them are US born. Okay? However, there's all these European born. So, so 11 out of these 20 women are coming from a bunch of Eastern European countries mostly. So it's not that white women can't do math at this level. Um, it's that white women growing up in the US aren't doing math. So there's very few of them being identified. So conclusion, strong correlation exists between women hired by top math departments and the ethnicities, birth countries of the girls identified. Um, okay. some, oh, so that should be some, some cultures produce both. Um, th this is really striking also. This is data on, by decade, of the percent of US citizens uh, PhDs in math that were going to women. And what's really striking uh, this, this, is, um, oh, this, this is the website. Gr Green, Green just came out with a book a few months ago. That's a phenomenal book of, about the first 224 women PhDs in the US. You could go read it. Uh, if you look at by decade, uh, prior to 1890s, women were excluded from, from going to graduate school to be able to even attempt to do a PhD. But once they were allowed in, uh, initially you had 11 to 15% of US citizen PhDs went to women. But then after World War II, it crashed and was down at about 5%. It did not start coming back up until uh, post Title IX. Okay? And in this decade, it's now at around 30%. So lots of women are capable of doing math at a PhD level. Um, but here, there was clearly something going on preventing that from happening. And one thing I was thinking, a lot of the faculty still on in these top math departments were hired back in the 60s and 70s in the post-Sputnik era and the baby boomers going off to college. So a lot of that hiring was being done when there were very few women in the, in the applicant pool. Um, so hopefully now that we have a lot more women getting their PhDs, these numbers are going to be rising. Okay, so scarcity of top caliber women mathematicians in the US is largely due to changeable environmental factors, not lack of intrinsic aptitude, as Larry Summers was suggesting. 
And math circles are needed throughout the US to enable mathematically gifted students to interact regularly with like-minded peers, um, which MOP is great, but it's only one month a year, and there's not that many kids who can get to MOP. It would be nice for lots of kids all over the country to be able to interact with like-minded kids. And to learn math, uh, their school teachers are unable to provide, which, you know, the type of proofs you saw yesterday, very few high school math teachers could possibly be working with kids doing that. Without uh, the math circles, US is losing most talented white boys as well as girls and historically underrepresented minorities. And then I thank my collaborators and also uh, various people who helped me to collect the data for these studies. Thank you. <laughs>